thanks for joining us on this episode, the incredible Tom Zaki. And as usual, Legends and Losers is sponsored by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. Check out netsuite.com slash legends to turbocharge your growth. Now, Tom, here's what I tell you. This episode is complete garbage. <laughs> and what I mean by that is Tom is the founder and chief executive of an incredible company called TerraCycle. And they are a company that makes consumer products from waste. He makes the argument that waste is a human idea and one that doesn't exist in nature. And he's got some big ideas for how we can transform garbage as we know it into a thing of the past. All right, all right, all right. The Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher and man, am I ever glad you joined us for this episode of Legends and Losers, uh, where we aspire to have authentic dialogues with amazing people about what it really takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life. Uh, Matt Fecklestein calls us the best ride on the internet, and Bob O'Brien says we're edgy and inspiring, <laughs> and we've got all of those things uh, today. Uh, now, before we get to Tom, I um, just wanted to uh, share with you, if you're somebody who is in marketing, in the events world, uh, somebody who books speakers, I want to call your attention to my friend Will Little. He was on episode 86 and 87 of Legends and Losers. And Will is one of the 10 most inspiring people that I know. I would encourage you to check out those episodes and uh, check out Will, W-I-L-L, -L, the letter V, Little, L-I-T-T-L-E, dot com. And here's what I'll tell you for sure. When Will Little is speaking, nobody's on their smartphone. All right, Tom Zaki. Um, this is an extraordinary guy. Uh, he's a fun guy. Uh, my partner on Niche Down, Heather Clancy, has known and followed Tom and his company, TerraCycle, for quite some time. Tom's featured in our new book, uh, Niche Down, and the reason is he has niched down <laughs> in a big way. Uh, he's creating a niche around getting rid of the whole concept of garbage as we know it, and he's done it in a way where he can make it economically viable uh, by mobilizing, in some cases, entire industries um, to take whatever garbage and crapola and waste that they create um, and turn it back into something useful in an economic way. This is a riveting conversation with a spectacular guy, and I sure hope you love it. Here he is, the legendary Tom. Garbage is one of the most fascinating things in the world, and so I'll give you some examples. Maybe first and foremost, think about it this way. Every single possession you own, you know, everything in the room right now that you have will one day be owned by the garbage industry without a single exception, not one exception. And here's the crazy part. You know, the, uh, the things you have, your stuff, you know, you've paid for, you've spent money on, it's value to you. When it gets to the garbage industry, they're going to view it as a liability, something to get paid to get rid of. And to me, that's totally insane. Uh, and for how everything becomes waste, without a single exception, the level of innovation, the level of what happens is dismally low, you know? And I think the reason is because garbage is undesirable, not just undesirable, you know, on, on the surface, but we're built to hate it. You know, we're <laughs> built to be repulsed from our poo, right? Which is our, you know, natural waste. But we're built to, like, if our kids come to us and say, you know, we want to be in the garbage business, we would be negative on that, you know, not positive, right? And so innovation is at just an absolute low for how big it really is. Uh, am I remembering this right, Tom, that you have said something along the lines of that the, the garbage or the waste industry has the least amount of innovation of any industry? Oh, and yes, absolutely. And I say this partly being owned in multiple countries by the world's biggest garbage companies. You know, so uh, we operate in 21 countries and in more than half of them, the largest local garbage companies in those countries own a part of my local business. So we know them inside and out. And it, look, innovation is not a zero, but compare it to high tech, pharma, I mean, you name it, entertainment, it's dismally, dismally low. I, that's interesting. Of course, something I never thought about, <clears throat> but when I read that you had said that, I thought, wow, that's fascinating. The other one I found fascinating, tell me if I'm remembering this right, that you also said is something along the lines of the definition of garbage is when somebody pays you to take it away. 
Did, yeah. Did, am, I, am, I remember, am I remembering that right, right, Tom? Well, this is an interesting way to think about it. You know, when I first fell in love with garbage, I was uh, in freshman at university. Uh, and uh, I was taking econ Like all freshmen at university do, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was thinking Econ 101 classes, right? And in Econ 101, you basically, all you do is draw supply and demand curves. And, you know, so the general theory of supply and demand, of course, is that if you have more supply of a product, the price goes down. If you have more demand, it goes up and you draw these intercepts. But where would you put garbage, right? Take diapers, Diapers are 3% of our landfills, so they have phenomenal supply. Oh, hold on, can I slow you down there for a second? Diapers are 3% of landfill. That's right. And here's some crazy stats. Not only, of course, do kids wear diapers, but 50% of men over 50 wear diapers. 50%. You know, I've got 14 years to go until I fall into whoa, that demographic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> slow down there, handsome. I just turned 50. What did you just say well, about well, men well, over 50? What? 50% of men over 50 wear, and I'll say it more politely, adult incontinence products. Well, and I thought I heard, an ad, you know, because my brain is wired around marketing and, of course, categories and all that stuff. You know about niche down and all the stuff we're doing. And I, I, I saw an ad for a female adult diaper. And, um, ah, shit, I'm trying to remember what they called it. The category name was fascinating. It was like, it wasn't incontinence. It had a really great name. Damn it. I'm yeah. sure it'll come to me as soon as we stop this discussion. But anyways, 50% of guys over 50 are wearing an adult diaper. That's right. That's right. And so they're actually a bigger part of the diaper platform, you know, overall the total volume, because in, when you're a child, right, when you're a baby, you get out of diapers at some point. But as an adult, once you're in, you never get out. <laughs> I love all this shit we have to look forward to, right? Well, look, there are virtues, you know. I sort of fantasize about wearing a diaper from time to time in the sense of you're at a cocktail party and you have a great conversation and you just really have to, you know, go to the bathroom. This way you can just keep talking. You're good to go. Now, look, if you're doing a number one, I'd be totally down for it. If I have some poop to walk around with, that's a little harder. But, you know, there's always silver lining. We don't have to vilify everything. There's some nice uh, benefits of, uh, you know, of that potentially. <laughs> so uh, a quick diversion on that. <clears throat> there's one environment I'm in on a regular basis that allows me to piss myself. Oh, Yeah. And that's surfing. I'm a surfer. I live two blocks from the beach. If there's waves, I'm in the water on a pretty regular basis. Nice. And, of course, uh, the joke we like to tell is there's two kinds of surfers, those who pee in their wetsuit and those who lie. Yes. Um, and I don't know if you remember this. There was this movie called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Do you remember mm -hmm. this movie? Yeah. And do you remember when uh, Steve Martin is playing the, you know, sort of – S mentally handicapped or, or, or seriously stupid. Uh, I don't know if it's son or, or nephew or whatever it is, as part of this ruse that Steve, uh, that um, Michael Caine and Steve Martin are trying to pull on this gal. And there's a scene where they're in this ding dong. It might even be the house they're in, but they're having this very fancy looking dinner. And, to, and his name was Ruprick. I'll never forget the name. It was funny. And there's this moment where they're having this nice dinner and Rupert is sitting there and he, he, he looks up at them and he goes, uh, thank you, because he just peed himself at the dinner table. And so as a result of that, long story longer, me and my buddies, when we're in the water and we're waiting for the next set to come and we're all chit chatting like, you know, ladies at tea or whatever. When one of us pees, we look at the other one while we're talking about whatever it is we're talking about and we just go, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm and glad so, you're honest about it, right? <laughs> yeah, and so the ability to just pee whenever you want is kind of fun. It really is. So there you go. There's a future virtue of uh, of uh, diapers, you know, coming your way, right? Now, if you this is going to sound terrible, but if you you know, let's say you've had a couple of beers and you really need to pee, I mean, how much can one of these adult diapers take? So, you know, surprisingly a lot. Um, so we know this well because we're, you know, in the recycling diapers and, and so on. But you'd be really surprised. So diapers have inside it technically a thing called SAP. It's like a super absorbent polymer. And it absorbs like 200 times its size in uh, liquid. So you can pour like a solid two, three, four cups of liquid into a diaper without uh, leakage, you know. And uh, yeah, they're pretty uh, technically amazing. I mean, there's been some amazing engineering, you know, going into these things ever since they emerged. I mean, compared to like cloth or whatever people wore back in the day. And uh, but, you know, going back to the whole like, you know, waste thing, right? Like so diapers have phenomenal supply, 3%. But their demand 
Would you, would you, um, you know, pay anything for a dirty diaper if I were able to give you one today? Would I want to pay for it? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you a great deal. Like whatever you want to pay. Would you, would you, uh, would we have a transaction? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not a dad and you know, I, I'm not really don't want your dirty diaper there, Tom. <laughs> no, fair, fair point. So it's so now if it was, let's just say theoretically, now let me go the other way. Would, how much would you want me to pay you to take one? There's probably a number there, right? Well, yeah, uh, actually, another side diversion. Y years ago, when I was married to my first wife, I was on this business trip to Europe. And I got, uh, you know, I landed and my phone had, you know, a thousand messages and all that. And you know what it's like when you when, when that happens, you look at your phone, and there's all this, these, your wife's trying to get a hold of you. It's not good. Anyway, no. there, it turned out there was a, a dead skunk under our deck. Ooh. And it was, you know, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. The smell is unbelievable. And That's right. anyway, to, to, to net it all out, this guy, I don't know what the company was called, Skunks or Us, whatever the fuck he was called. He shows up and he takes the floorboards out of the thing and he, and he gets the skunk and he puts it in his truck and he takes it away. And I think if I remember right, he charged just like 120 bucks or something. Right. And to your right. point, I would have paid him 10 grand to get rid of that thing. <laughs> well, this is it, right? So this is the beauty of waste is that legally, this is quite interesting because there is a, there's actually a legal definition of waste. It's something you're willing to pay to get rid of. In other words, there's positive supply and massive fucking quantities of it, but negative demand. And, it's well, and I've also heard you say, you might have even said it in Niche Down when, when you were talking to Heather, that your industry is the only industry that has a, uh, am I getting this right, a negative uh, raw materials cost or something along those lines? That's exactly right. My input, people pay me to take, right? So it's like if, if uh, you know, if, if in the metaphor of the diaper, while you won't buy it from me, you'd probably buy it from me at a negative price. So if I pay you a hundred bucks, maybe it's worth your while to take the diaper. And if it's not a hundred, at least at a thousand, you may take it, but there's a number we can get to. And that's If you the, gave me 10 grand, I would take the diaper. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, uh, you know, even offline, fine. <laughs> offline, I've got a few, I've got some young kids, so we'll, uh, we'll sort that out for you. <laughs> but this is it, right? So everything becomes waste and it all ends up becoming negative raw material value. And to me, that is so fascinating and so disturbing that no one sees it like, well, I mean, I guess disturbing in one way and also really a big opportunity in another. Well, and this is what I love about you. And obviously we're just meeting, but I've gotten to know you through Heather telling me and of course through, through uh, you being in our book, which, you know, thank you so much. You're such a great example of what we're trying to communicate to the world. And to this point, legendary entrepreneurs, legendary innovators, and, and what, what we think of as category designers, the people who teach the world to think about a new way of, of looking at a problem and a solution, they see things that others don't. And so it's, it's, it's fascinating, particularly with this, which, you know, is a topic that everybody goes, uh, fuck, get, get this out the house. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's maybe a, a lesson there, right? Because if you think about the industries, the super sexy ones, the ones that everyone's like, oh my God, I dream about being there. They're really crowded with amazing people. And that makes it very hard to you know, uh, 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 be unique. Like think about, you know, like, the, like uh, the rock and roll industry, right? Like, man, everyone wants to be a rock and roll star. So how many pe people are trying to take those very few spots and there's huge amount of innovation in music. You know, the idea of music changes and evolves and it's so amazing. Um, but that's because there is, you know, tons of people in it really pushing it along. But yeah. you don't get in the industry where you are repulsed by it, where it's, you know, those are the ones to actually look out for uh, in this particular uh, uh, example, because it, there, no one's going to go for them. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember years and years ago when I was a young pup in business and I was working in the very beginning of what today we call CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And one of my clients, this would have been uh, probably the late 90s, mid 90s, was, um, and I love the name of the company too, Batesville Casket Co. 
<laughs> in Batesville, Indiana, right? Like as in Norman Bates, right? It's like, how yeah. fucking crazy is this? Batesville casket code. And I think they're still around. They were uh, one of the top two or three uh, casket providers in the country at the time. And, and, you know, they always had all these funny jokes. So, you know, you'd ask them how, how's business and they say, oh, it's killing us. And, you know, they had all those kinds of jokes. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the funeral director industry and the casket industry and sort of everything around, you know, dying, if you will, uh, as I was thinking about, you know, it's, it's somewhat similar in that it's, it's a, it's a whole space that makes people go. Ugh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But you know what? Everyone dies one day. That's, you know, maybe one of the only noble truths, right, uh, that are out there. And uh, so it's inevitable, and that means it's a guaranteed thing, right? Just yeah. like, you know, garbage is sort of the death of everything else, right? Everything breaks. It's the law of nature. And so what happens, you know, to it then? And I think, you know, there's so many amazing uh, metaphors from, uh, from nature in this, you know, in the sense that, like, in nature, it's an incredibly complex ecosystem of what eats what right like I even heard that there's like own butterflies that can only pollinate certain flowers and you know the panda bear only eats eucalyptus and nothing else so it's incredibly wo woven and exceptionally complicated yet in our system we try to invent mega organisms you know that eat everything and we call those landfills and incinerators and you know there is this it's not the same uh, as what's been taught to us you know by the natural system you know and how to think about it and that's where i see just this tremendous opportunity and it's not just a business opportunity i mean garbage is a crisis you know where um, both you and i have just drank some uh, some liquid you know while we've been sitting here we both drank microplastic as we've been on the show right now talking all of us, yeah. both of us, you know, it's in our water, it's in our bodies. Um, it's, it's, it's a big issue. And this is only since the plastics were invented in the 1950s. So it's only getting epically worse. Well, and, and I might be off a little bit, but of course, we, we now are get, gaining more awareness of these giant uh, plastic, uh, I don't even know what to call them, islands or, you know, whatever the fuck they are in the oceans. If my memory is correct, the largest one is off the coast of the West Coast uh, of California. Yeah. And I, I think I read, I might be off, but I think I read it's more than two times larger than Texas. Do, do, do you know? Is that right? It's, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. But to build on it, there's five of those. In every major ocean, there's a gyre the size, somewhere between one and three times the size of Texas, times five. And uh, here's the crazy part. That's what's floating on top, which is only 5% of the garbage, 95% sinks to the bottom. Whoa, whoa, whoa. S slow down here, handsome. So 95% of the garbage in the ocean we don't yeah. see? Oh, that's right. No so, one even So that we have that giant, uh, giant island twice the size of Texas or whatever actual size yeah. it is. They're in each ocean. They're yeah. massive. They're disgusting. I've seen the photos, the videos. I'm, I'm sure many people have as well. But that's only 5%. The rest of it's under the ocean. That's right. That's right. And Fucking A, dude. What the fuck is wrong nuts. with us? Well, you know what it is. I'll tell you. It's one simple thing. It's our addiction to disposability. That's the root cause. Right? So it's not... This is the weird part. Recycling is not the answer to garbage. Everything I do, you know, at TerraCycle is not the answer. The answer is we have to consume, not that we need to stop buying, that's an unrealistic thing, right? It's just not gonna happen. But instead of buying cheap disposable shit that lasts you know, one use, we need to rethink that and buy durable, amazing stuff that lasts in a timeless way for a very long time. Actually, the way it was with our grandparents and their parents and fucking everyone before that. In, you know, the, the idea of disposability is so crazy unbelievable. So I'll give you some, just some fun stats to sort of highlight this. 99% of all products become garbage within one year. 99%. An average woman uh, in the Western world today, like an average American lady, buys 67 apparel items a year. And this is the crazy part. Uses them on average five times before throwing them out. Five times before throwing out everything. And you compare that to the 1920s, you know, an average American lady in the 1920s sewed her own clothes and probably had one or two. And, you know, as guys, we would go out and cobble our shoes. I mean, when's the last time anyone's cobbled their shoes before, you know, or <laughs> like, what? Like it doesn't I don't exist. even know if people know the name cobbler anymore. I think, I think when you hear cobbler, people think peach. Right. Exactly right. And so this uh, durability used to be important. 
right? It used to be valued, you know, the idea to build something to last used to be a big deal. But the problem and why I think we're so addicted to disposability is because it's crazy as cheap and really convenient. Way more convenient to buy a cup of coffee and a shitty paper cup and throw it out and get a new one than take a mug and wash it out and fill it up again. And that's the problem. Right. Isn't it cr- like if you think about, and I don't mean to pick on Starbucks because I think they're probably trying to be a good company. Uh, but, you know, if you think about Starbucks by way of example, it, it is crazy that, that, that we allowed ourselves to be trained to buy a coffee in a disposable mug or, or cup or whatever, as opposed to showing up with our own cup, right? That's just a behavioral thing, right? It is. It is. And by the way, Starbucks, point of fact, gives you 10% off if you show up with a durable cup. Wow. I wonder, I didn't know that. Um, I wonder what, maybe they don't promote it enough or maybe I'm unconscious, but th- that, that's no, a very, no, no. very cool of them. They, they, a, I think it's super cool, and B, they should promote it more because I think it's a bit too silent. But and then I think I the, just heard, did, am, I rem- am I hearing this right? Uh, you, you might know this, that um, uh, uh, is it McDonald's that's now examining getting rid of the straw? Yeah, that's right. And you know why it's happening? It's, uh, so, yes, New York City is looking to outlaw plastic straws. Uh, France is looking to outlaw them. McDonald's as a corporation is just going to do it proactively. Here's why it's happening is because this whole ocean plastic thing has really finally woken up people. People have really now realized that it is like catastrophic, catastrophic. And it's not just what I told you about what it is today. Every two seconds of an entire garbage truck of garbage goes into the ocean. Every two seconds, 25% of all the garbage in the world goes into our oceans. And we can blame like Vietnam and, you know, Northern Africa and the places that don't have good waste management. But man, New York City used to dump 100% of its garbage into the ocean 10 miles off the coast of New York up until the like 1990s. New York City. That's Isn't fucking that unbelievable. Up until the 90s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're you know, just as guilty It's funny you for say it. that. I mean, in Santa Cruz where I live, you know, most of the people who live here love the ocean. It's a big part of why we live here. Um, the ocean air here is incredible. The Monterey Bay is super protected and all that. And so generally we don't have a lot of trash and bullshit. Um, that said, you know, my wife and I like to go for walks and, and, and we walk to the ocean pretty much every day. And, and Tom, I come back home every day with a pocket full of cigarette butts. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's, uh, you know, number one litter, most littered item, 37% of litter are cigarette butts, right? I mean. Well, and they're toxic to fish and to otters and to seals and all that. And so, look, I, I know it's probably not doing very much that, you know, that the dozen or two dozen or a couple, whatever it is on each walk. But yeah, I come home with a pocket full of them. To try well, to make and, uh, please, by the way, you know, on those cigarette butts, uh, send it to us. You know, we uh, recycle cigarette butts nationally in the U.S. for free. We, we pay your shipping. We even give you, I think, a dollar for every pound of cigarette butts you send us to uh, keep America beautiful to do their good work. So, uh, you know, check out our website. I, I, you know what I'll do then? Because we recycle. We, um, we have a compost bin. We have a, a wonderful garden. So, you yeah. know what? I'll set up a, a little Tom cigarette butt compost bin. And how, how heavy do you want it to be when I send it to you? Oh, the more the better. I'll take okay, anything. So maybe, maybe what, uh, two or three times a year? I'll send you a whole bunch of cigarette butts from, from California. <laughs> do it. Do it. I'm not kidding. You uh, go to the site, download the shipping label, and you get some cash for it. Uh, so, uh, you know, let's, let's make That's it. great. And I'll, yeah. I'll donate your cash to a Santa Cruz school or, you know, local Good. charity. Good. Please, please. And so, you know, t- I just want to make sure I understand. You'll take cigarette. You'll take as many cigarette butts as you can get? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, nationally recycle cigarette butts in 11 countries, hundreds of millions of butts a month, and uh, we pay the shipping and then give you a donation to a school or charity of your choice uh, for doing so. And, and why is um, cigarette butt collection a good business for, for you, Tom? Well, so our business basically boils down, uh, you know, to understand like, you know, how, how terrorists cycle works. We basically have three business models. And the first one is all about how do we collect and recycle the non-recyclable like cigarette butts, but also, I mean, you name it, um, dirty diapers, uh, chewing gum, food packaging, pens, toothbrushes, cosmetics, hundreds of waste streams. And what we do is uh, uh, we set up national programs to collect and recycle these. We get them funded by the producers. 
So the tobacco industry pays for our cigarette butt recycling program or, uh, you know, uh, Colgate for whatever our toothbrush recycling program and, you know, so on and so forth. And this gives, you know, millions of Americans the chance to do this at no cost, free shipping and donations and all that. Now, I, I want to interrupt you here if I could. How did you, you know, so if you think about the cigarette companies and everybody views them as evil and all that stuff, how did you convince the cigarette companies to pay you to do this? Well, it's the same answer as anyone, even, uh, you know, we work with, I mean, everybody. And the answer is that it benefits them uh, to make their products recyclable uh, because people will choose cigarette A versus cigarette B, or they'll choose you know, shampoo A versus shampoo B, because the shampoo A is the recyclable one and maybe shampoo B uh, is not. And so that uh, differentiation creates uh, better sales, uh, you know, increases their share, and that pays for the cigarette recycling program. And, you know, yes, I would, I would say cigarettes are totally, you know, bad things. People shouldn't smoke. But the people inside tobacco companies are not innately evil people. I really have rarely met a, a deeply evil person. I mean, they do exist, but man, they're rare. People are generally good people. And they'd rather uh, uh, spend money on doing the right thing and win, like you know, recycling cigarettes, than doing you know, the uh, uh, things that don't move the world forward, like just advertising or sponsoring a Formula One car or whatever they did with that money uh, before. And what's neat is, you know, this is what's opened my eyes and waste is, uh, is doing this because we recycle, I mean, man, everything, you know, you're, you got a, um, some really cool rock and roll stuff in yours. I'm thinking rock and roll when I see you. And, uh, so we, um, partner, for example, with Dario and recycle guitar strings. No way. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, Millions way, that's seriously cool. So I can, yeah, I can so send you my old guitar strings too. Dude, totally. Yes. Free again, totally free. You go to our site and you can send us your guitar strings. But here's, you want to hear a crazy one. So we've attached the guitar string recycling program to major tours like the U2 tour and other big uh, rock and roll tours like Dave Matthews. And I did not realize this till it came in, but we were getting or are getting every show from you too, like huge quantities of guitar strings. And I was like contacting our you know, friends over at Diderion and saying like, how the hell do these guys go through so many guitar strings in one show? And they said, oh, you didn't know? Every time after every song, the guitar is taken and they change the guitar strings after every song. And the reason is because, you know, there's 20,000 people in the stadium. You want to impress those people and make it perfect. And it's like tennis balls. Apparently, guitar strings wear out a little bit. So, you know, for five, you know, $20 or whatever for a set of strings, it's better to make sure they're perfect every time. But man, every now, show, every set of guitar strings are different. I, I, look, who am I to tell the edge anything about anything? <laughs> no, nobody. Um, yeah. But, you know, listen, and I'm a hack, by the way. I'm not good at this. I make a noise. Uh, and it's, you know, for fun. But, um, Listen, I was in touring bands as a kid, and you know, so I have a little bit of experience. And the weird thing about guitar strings is, I actually, and I, and I thought most other guitar players felt this way. Maybe they feel differently with the quality of them today, but that you actually didn't want to do a show with new guitar strings because it sort of takes a while and they sort of slip a little bit. And so, actually, yeah. the perfect guitar strings are—I don't know exactly how old, but you know, uh, uh, some strings that you've played on for a little bit, and they sort of settle in. Uh, but I guess the edge doesn't feel that way, huh? Well, and look, I—I I, I don't know anything about uh, about that at all. Like, uh, you know, I, I barely dabbled myself on guitar, but that is the fact. And it's not just you two; it's apparently industry-wide, this idea of changing it every single, uh, not set, every single song. And it wow. just shows you, right, the sheer like way garbage works is absolutely insane. Like I'll give you another one, just go into a completely different area. Go to an airport and look at how many plastic gloves, you know, a TSA person uses. We do a lot of plastic gov recycling at, uh, at airports. And it's uh, the average is something like every 20 minutes, a, a security guard, you know, in the airport security line will take on and off a, plastic, a, pla a, a pair of plastic gloves every 20 minutes. So if you have that's five sets an hour and on an eight hour shift, that's uh, 40 pairs of gloves per person, you know? Why, why do they need to change the gloves so often? It's just the behavior. I don't know. Maybe you get like a little sweaty or maybe you, I think they only put them on when they do the pat downs and they prefer not wearing them the whole time. So if I'm patting you down, I put on my glove, do the pat down, you know, all that stuff. And then when you go, I throw them out. And then when the next guy comes five minutes later, I put the new pair on, pat you down. You know, it's that shit, right? But it's, it's, that's this weird. Kind you know, of, is it, 
Uh, another tangent, Tom, but I, when I was a kid, I was an orderly for a while in a hospital. And, you know, you're taking your gloves on and off all the, all the time in, that, in a hospital environment. At least you were back then. <clears throat> and um, you, as part of it, you got to wash your hands. And your hands get really fucked up and sore and dry. And now maybe they do it today with Purell. I don't know. But I would imagine there's some cleaning of their hands they do as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this maybe has turned into some n- nervous twitch for TSA agents or something. I haven't, man. I, I, yeah, it's uh, it's nuts. But like, I got to tell you, the, uh, the 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 behaviors and the way our system is uh, is built is totally insane. I'll give you another crazy one. This is Brazil, right? So we operate down in Brazil, and in Brazil, because it's an informal economy. So here, when you buy a product, like you go buy whatever, like some uh, you know, like a Mars bar, you go into the uh, store and you pay the sales tax when you buy the product. Okay. In Brazil, because it's so informal, the government can't collect sales tax from the store. So sales tax is paid when the product is made. Makes total sense. Easier to collect the sales tax. I get it. Because they can't get the cashiers and the, and the customers to actually give them the tax because it's like, yeah, it's, the man, it's so informal. It's like a dude <laughs> with a bodega, everything cash. There's no way the government would collect anything if it goes down to the, uh, to the seller. I get that. Okay. So it's totally realistic. Fine. But, so check this, there's this whole industry there uh, that, uh, uh, so let's say you are Johnny Walker and you make, you know, scotch. Uh, and uh, you've made a, you know. 100- now we're talking, Tom, let's talk about scotch. That's right, that's right. So you've made 100 million bottles for the market and you paid your sales tax on each, which is in Brazil, is freaking high. It's like a high percentage, right? So now you're out a ton of money on sales tax that you've paid on all this scotch, but you only sold not 100 million bottles, but 90 million. So you have 10 million left over. So there's a whole industry set up down there who takes that extra 10 million bottles, and I've seen this with like Johnny Walker Blue on pallets, puts it into shredders to destroy it to get the sales tax back. Wait a minute. I just want to understand what you just said. Are you saying they purposely destroy good bottles of Johnny Walker? Oh, yeah. And in the pallet load. Fucking A, that's mental. I know. And not just that. I mean, like, everything. Like, that's just an example, you know, but like... So this mid- happens with every product. If any product everything. I can think of, this yeah. happens. Whatever. Because if they don't From destroy razor it, blades. they don't get the tax. This is that's crazy. Right. Why don't they... They should give... You know what they should do? You should get a tax credit for giving this away, and, and, and Johnny Walker should just give the booze away to homeless people. No, so it's so funny you say that because take the clothing industry. We do a lot in the clothing industry and in the clothing industry, there's a phenomenal amount of clothing that doesn't sell, right? Like not everything in your H&M or Gap or whatever is going to sell. But a lot of clothing companies do not donate the clothing uh, and instead destroy it, destroy crazy percentages of it. And the higher end the clothing, the more this is the case because Chanel doesn't want a poor person walking around with a Chanel bag or, you know, Ray-Ban doesn't want a poor person walking around with a pair of Ray-Bans. And because it takes the market value down because this shit isn't worth what you pay for it. You know, like the actual cost to make this stuff is not it. So it's the perception of value that makes you pay $500 for a pair of sunglasses. And if you see a poor person with it, your perception of value goes down. You know what it reminds me a little bit of? What was that movie with Will Ferrell and um, Stiller uh, about the fashion industry? Oh, um, Zoolander. Zoolander, thank you. And do you remember the, 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 um, uh, Will Ferrell is playing the, the, the fashion designer and, and he's yeah. rolling out his new you know, fall line or whatever? Do you remember what the fashion line was? It wasn't like a homeless thing, was it, by any chance? It was. It was a fashion line, you know, inspired by homeless people. And the reason I remember it, because I think it's a funny word, he called it a new category of clothing called derelict. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. (laughs) And so if I'm I'm Chanel or whoever, I don't want my bags to be viewed as derelict. That's right. But you you see the point, though, right? There's actually, unfortunately, real business logic there. You know, like a so lot they send, of they send those bags or those glasses or whatever it is to right, straight to the landfill. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I give you an example because we recycle a lot of higher end goods, and we have to have security make sure that no one takes it because the risk of theft and then resale and as such dilution of the market price is really big. 
So in that Brazil company, I've toured it once, there are seven security guards, seven security companies, independent ones, and then a secret one that no one knows about watching each other because the biggest risk is someone making like $3 an hour every five minutes putting 100 grand of product into a shredding machine. I mean, don't you just want to be like, look, I'll take a bag wow. for myself. Well, and, and I'm curious, uh, where do they pour the scotch? <laughs> you don't even want to know. <laughs> Do they pour it into the ocean do, or do I they? I will destroy it a bottle at a time. Just give me like, you know, half hour a bottle and I'm on it, man. Hey, you know? listen, I have, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I have a Scottish liver and um, uh, we can handle it, right? Well, we should go to Brazil and, uh, and uh, volunteer our services. We, they don't even have to pay us, you know? We'll just uh, hang out. Exactly. We, can be, we, yeah. we will happily volunteer to, for Johnny Walker to be their Scotch uh, disposal system, you and me. Okay. <laughs> Totally, totally, exactly. So, but like this, you know, it's, it's, isn't it crazy sad though, right? Like, you know, the bad part is there's actual business logic, you know, uh, in it. And it makes sense from a banking point of view, a PL, whatever point of view. But there's a lot of work put in to make this stuff, you know? Like, if you think about like a leather bag that has the same problem, an animal was killed to produce that for no fucking reason at all. Not even anyone got anything out of it. I thought what they did was that this is a big part of the private. I thought this was a big part of the private label world that you take last year's shit, you tear your logo off it, you, you sell it to somebody for you know less than you would if it was going through your normal channel. They put some other logo on it so nobody knows it's Chanel or Chateau Neuf Ding Dong or whatever the fuck. And, and that way you can still get some amount of money on, on, on these products. I didn't realize they just threw them the fuck out. Well, this is so um, to some, the answer is, is, is not black and white. So the cheaper the goods, the more you see secondary market. So if you make like a, a cheap, super cheap, whatever, yes, you're going to do exactly that. You're going to sell it at a discount store. It's going to show up at TJ Maxx or whatever the hell. The higher the good, the lo bigger the difference between the manufacturing price and the sell price. So you're not really out that much money by getting rid of it. And the more you donate, the more it's out there, the more you're actually taking down your sell price, so the more it makes sense to throw it out. So the higher end the world, the bigger the garbage problem by wow. magnitude. Because imagine, you know, if you sell a bag for 10 grand and it costs you 100 bucks to make it, there, way uh, there better. There are purses for 10 grand? There, oh, that's, uh, or more, or more. Wow, 10 yeah, grand for a purse. <laughs> wow, you could be driving around in that purse. I mean, you can get a pretty good car in this country for 10 grand. You can totally no, but I mean, I was shocked when you see some of the prices on these higher end, you know, type things. And it again, and we were talking ten grand on a purse, but I'll give you a good example in the sneaker industry, like running shoes. We have clients. I won't mention their names. This will, uh, you know, won't be good for them. Is that we can offer shoe reuse as an option when we collect used shoes, but we can also offer shoe recycling. You know, where we shred them up and make it into like track and field surfaces. The shoe reuse, man, is way better for the environment, right? You get, you know, someone else gets a pair of shoes and they're way better than just a bunch of rubber on a field. And the, a, uh, you know, the, the mass market medium end, medium end, you know, shoe companies whose shoes sell for like 80 bucks will not let us reuse them and will force us to recycle them for exactly the same reason I described. We're not just wow. talking like 10 grand objects. We're talking like the stuff you buy at your, you know, on your normal go, go to the mall. Because otherwise they're destroying their own market. That's how they feel about it. They're destroying the, so if you can buy that pair of shoes in a goodwill for a buck, you won't buy them at Walmart for 50. Right. Right. And I would have thought maybe with things like eBay and all, all these other new uh, kind of platforms that have emerged over the last, uh, you know, 10 to 25 years that, you know, maybe they would self do some of that stuff, but cl clearly not. No, because again, it takes the potential. If you see on eBay a pair of like, what do Ray-Bans go for? Like 200 bucks, right? Like if you go to a sunglass hut, let's say. E easily. I mean, I have Maui gyms that are over 300 bucks. Okay. So 300 bucks, right? So if you saw those on eBay for 10 bucks, would you go and buy the $300 pair too? Well, actually, if I saw them for 10 bucks on eBay, my assumption would be they are counterfeit. But let's just say, you know, you were credible, whatever of BS and like you knew they were real. Well, yeah, of course, if, if, if the choice is the exact same product and you knew it and one's 10 and one's three, the, the, you know, the answer is obvious. Right. But you're not going to buy two pairs of the same glasses, right? You're going to only buy one. Well, if there were 10 bucks, I might buy three or four pairs because I tend to lose them and break them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean, right? You would have never bought a $300 version. No, and never. 
Never. And that's the problem because once you don't buy the $300 version, once you never buy it again, right? Like a good example, once I uh, saw this in sunglasses, I used to buy, you know, a pair of Ray-Bans every year or so. So I was worth to that company, you know, a few hundred dollars a year. Since then, I've never bought a pair. Well, yeah, because I guess you get them yourself and because and, you're, you're in this wonderful business. Now, you guys no, I are... Would never, I would never take it out of the palette, right? <laughs> no, I'm sure you never would. And you certainly wouldn't touch the scotch. Um, no, definitely not. I would wash it go down the drain. Uh, now, you guys, and this is, you know, there's so much I love about you and your business. Um, you guys are innovating in a way that you tell me, it sounds like the vast majority of the quote unquote big guys in the, in the waste business never thought about it. And so uh, if we sort of get to the business for a sec, um, yeah. how is it you're able to, whether it's cigarette butts or diapers or these things that uh, you tell me for the most part, prior to you guys, people didn't think that they were recyclable. They just went into landfills and, and made a big stink. And some of them took forever to decompose. How is it you're able to take a diaper or, or any of these hard to recycle things and actually uh, recycle them? So the great, the, the two parts to that, you know, you mentioned the big waste management companies. Here's the key way to look at a big waste management company. And I preface this by saying, we're in 21 countries and in more than half, I've sold, you know, somewhere between a quarter and a third of my business to the largest garbage companies in those countries all over the world. So we know these guys inside and out and they've bought into us. So what's the business of a normal waste management company? Mine garbage for what they can get value from, which is what we call recycling, just for things like aluminum cans and some bottles and whatnot, and everything else destroy as cheaply as possible by burning it or putting it in a pile, which we call landfill incineration. And so that's the normal uh, uh, overall model. And because of that, they're only looking for things of value. So here's a good way to uh, put a metaphor on this. If I put a bar of gold on the floor near you, would you bother, bother picking it up? Yeah, I'd pick it up probably pretty quickly. <laughs> okay, cool. If I put, you know, say a, uh, a little bit of copper on the floor, would you pick that up? Yeah, I probably would. If I put a turd on the floor near you, like a nice dog turd, nice fresh one, would you pick it up? Well, uh, you're, you might be asking the wrong guy. Um, I, I, if I was able, like if I had something to pick it up, I would. And I'm also a guy who picks up chicken shit in, in, in vast quantities every day. But that said, if I didn't have something to pick it up, I would not even if, like I, when people with their dogs shit on the beach, I want to punch them in the face. But right. I don't, you know, right. I'm not going to pick it up with my bare hands, so no. But you wouldn't pick it up and then desire it. You wouldn't cherish it like you would the bar of gold, right? No, when I pick up, you know, shit on the beach, if I have a bag with me or something like that, I throw it in the garbage. Okay, but if you picked up the bar of gold, you wouldn't throw it in the garbage, right? No, I'd take it home and, and probably drink some scotch and celebrate. <laughs> right. So this is the point, right? So what is the gold? What they bother to go pick up is your aluminum can, right? Your newspaper. And and that's pretty limited. Everything else is that piece of dog shit that it's not worth their time to pick it up because uh, there's no value there. It's just absolutely pointless. And so they basically ignore 80% of things and never bother to even try to think about how do you process it because they could never make money on the material. So cigarette butts, you know, when we collect and recycle them, we invented that process. We shred them. We, you know, compost the organics like the ash tobacco and paper and we take the filter which is cellulose acetate, it's a type of plastic, make it into uh, things like ashtrays and whatnot. But the value of the recovered material doesn't cover my cost to collect and process it. Just like when we do dirty diapers, the value of the recovered dirty diaper is greater than zero, but it's not enough to cover the cost of collecting those diapers and processing it. And that's the case for 80% of all objects from guitar strings to toothbrushes to pens to you name it. I mean, just just because I can see your room, everything in your room will be garbage one day. And the only thing that's recyclable is it looks like a plastic bottle and some paper. So th th this bottle is recyclable. My note, my notebook. No, that one's not because it's this the one in not. front. If I, no, uh, the, this, no, one, this no, one? That one, that's it. This one's actually glass. Oh yeah, then it's definitely recyclable. But this, but the, this uh, Camelback uh, bottle, plastic no, bottle. because it's colored. Oh, really? So this yeah, is color. not recyclable. This will sit in a landfill and, and be nasty. So clear glass, just like clear PET plastic bottles get recycled, but any form of colored glass, uh, brown or, or green, or any form of colored PET, which is like a soda bottle, will never be recycled because it makes it so low value. Again, it's not worth picking it up. It becomes moves from being gold to that 
you know, dog poop. So is the and way it so, works then is you just have to get players in the industry to pay you the Delta to make this yes. make sense. And they do that because they want the consumer goodwill. Is that, is it that simple or how should I think about it? It's, it's effectively that simple. Yeah. So we get the world's biggest consumer product companies, retailers and all that to fund the recycling of what couldn't be recycled before. And it's not just goodwill. It's a bit soft. It's that actually increases them against their competition. So it's, so here's a good example. Let's say you have, you know, a, a baby, you know, congratulations, you have a new baby, right? And you have to give diapers to that baby. And let's say you're choosing between Huggies and Pampers, just like that is the world really. So you're choosing between A and B. And what's the real difference between the two between us? We're not diaper experts. It's the same thing. It's a fucking diaper. Okay. If the Huggies one could be, uh, is not recyclable, but the Pampers one is, maybe you're going to choose Pampers. Right. And that shift of market share makes it worth it for them to fund diaper recycling, which they are. And I could, you know, a hundred other examples. And that, so that's our first model. It's and then at some we, point, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Tom, but yeah. so if I'm in, in this example, if I'm Huggies and I'm paying TerraCycle to do this and I can promote that it's fully recyclable, et cetera, et cetera, and Pampers starts to feel the heat, they're going to they're gonna get with the program, call you and do the same thing, are they not? Yes, and that's exactly uh, what happens in industries. We call it the tipping point. So that happened in coffee capsules. You know, so we started working with Nespresso to collect and recycle their coffee capsules, and uh, we now run that for them all over the world. And then other coffee companies started, coffee capsule companies like Dolce Gusto, Tossimo, Illy, all these guys who make their coffee and capsules started seeing that, man, consumers really want to make sure those capsules get recycled and we really need to have it. They started joining. And we've gotten calls, that was, you know, over the past 10 years, and we've gotten calls recently from companies who are in the coffee capsule business saying, we cannot launch a coffee capsule unless there's a recycling program. And then it's wow. tipped over. And that's magic because then everyone's got to get on board. So at the beginning, it's about get one company to win and differentiate, get the next one to agree. And then by the third one, it tips over and boom, we're in and we're done. We can move on to the next in, you know, waste stream. And, and Yeah. We, an analogy I love for this one is, um, is you got to get the big penguin in the water. You know, if you, you mm -hmm. see those, if, if you see those Nat Geo specials about, yeah. you know, Antarctica or wherever, and you see all the penguins and they're just standing there fucking around on the iceberg. And then the big Mac daddy goes in and then they all go. Blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's kind of like that, I guess. Yeah, it is. It is. So that's the first thing we do. You know, the second thing is not about making things recyclable, but instead getting garbage back into product, because it's one thing to make sure I recycle your diaper, but then let's make it out of garbage so that there's a, a circle going on. Right. And so there, you know, we do things like you mentioned ocean plastics. I wanted to mention this is, uh, you know, we run the world's biggest supply chain for ocean plastic where we collect ocean plastic everywhere in the world, from New Zealand to Brazil to China. I mean, everywhere we have local teams. And then we turn that into things like the head and shoulders bottle, the Dawn dish soap bottle, Tide, you know, other you know, things of that sort. And again, it's the same idea showing them that by integrating something like ocean plastic into something like the head and shoulders bottle, people will prefer that shampoo over something else, whatever other shampoo you may have bought. And, and then, so if I understand this from an, uh, an economics point of view, in the beginning, it's not economical to recycle that bottle or that plastic yeah. that ends up in that bottle. The companies in the industry underwrite TerraCycle to make up the delta so that you can pay for the recycling. And then when you sell it as a raw material, you get what you get. And, and that's how you therefore make money. Is that, is that yeah. how this works? Exactly right. You got it. Now, Tom... Well, you know, the minute you explain it, it sounds like a, well, duh. Yeah, right. But no one had figured this out before you, right? Yeah, and don't give me that much credit. I think it's because garbage, no one gives a shit, and no one bothered. You know what I mean? Like, it's sort of like, imagine if I had a field here filled with, you know, fucking gold and just no one opened the door and checked it out. It's not like we're some genius, you know, to do it. Well, I'll give myself a little credit, but it's not like world profound. We didn't invent penicillin here. We just yeah, but, bothered. But actually, I'm, let me argue with you about that there, handsome. <laughs> It actually is, right? Because, you know, I hear about these companies who are trying different methods to deal with the ocean plastic, yeah. to get back to that for a second. And there's some very cool, innovative things happening. And I'm sure you know way more about it than I do, but I've heard some of them. Um, <clears throat> but the number one problem that I have heard, and again, I'm, you know, it's eeny weeny bit educated, but not much, is that there heretofore is not much of a market to take this ocean plastic and then do something with it. Yeah, You're creating a whole new industry 
that That's solves right. that problem. And if so, therefore, if you believe garbage, in this case, ocean garbage is a big problem for our world. And to your point, I'm drinking it right now. Um, by creating a market to reuse this stuff, you actually are doing something very profound and important. Sure. No, no. No, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, and today our, our, you know, supply chain for ocean plastic is multi-million dollars in scale. You know, it's uh, gotten awards in the UN. It's big. It's growing. I mean, couldn't be happier. But to your earlier point, you know, when you think about all these questions, I mean, like we've invented the solution to recycling 300 unique waste streams from things like latex from balloons to condoms to you know femme hygiene products and picking the you know the out there ones chewing gum recycling we recycling just- tampons and condoms yeah i'll make them into a toothbrush and send it to you what do you think <laughs> oh fuck that sounds fantastic i'd like to brush my teeth with somebody's condom <laughs> but you do um, that right that's what you do tom that's what we do. That's what we do. And look, I'm, you know, I'm picking the ones that are a bit more, I like the dirty, nasty stuff personally, because it wakes people up. But you know, it's also benign things like, you know, um, uh, you know, a plastic glove, frankly, is the exact same, you know, uh, species of garbage as a condom is, as is a balloon, just, you know, it's much more exciting to, uh, one's more gnarly than the other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, you know, there's this word today you hear a lot in business and, uh, I, I increasingly am growing to dislike this word, and the word is disrupt. Oh, I fucking hate that word. You know, I'm Why so glad you say that. I, it's just so overused bullshit. Like, I just can't stand hearing disruption. Everyone's disrupting everything, and it's so, I just, I'm saturated by that word in entrepreneurship. And it's like, I go to, I judge some of these entrepreneurial contests, and man, like, the kids get up, and they're like, we're going to disrupt the blah, blah, blah sector. And it's like, fuck off, you know? Like exactly how I feel. I can't fucking take it. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, on this one, uh, for for um, our first book, Play Bigger, um, it was written by four of us, and myself included, but Kevin Maney, who's a, who's a professional writer, he really keyed in on this. And, and the insight that he had that ultimately made it into the book and, and, and I think is very powerful is legendary innovators don't set up to disrupt shit. It's right. an act of creation. I'm bringing yeah. something new. And sometimes yeah. that ends up displacing sometimes something old, i.e. disruption. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of the time it doesn't. But to get to it specifically for you, Tom, you did not disrupt this industry. You've partnered with the old yeah. guard in this industry who, you know, theoretically you could have given them all the finger and said, I'm disrupting you. But instead, you're helping the old uh, garbage companies adopt this new uh, paradigm and new approach, Right. That's exactly right. I'm all about, it's so funny, you know, like I was talking to a friend of mine and it's uh, it's sort of crude, but I'll mention it. It's like, we're not about trying to compete. We're instead, and this is the funny part, we work with the world's biggest companies and effectively climb up their asshole, like the garbage suit, right? And change them from the inside. (laughs) And why not, right? Like, imagine if I went to a tobacco company and said, you shouldn't exist, man. You make cigarette butts, they litter the street, birds build their nests from it, blah, blah, blah. Instead, I'm going to show you how to win by doing the right thing. Yeah. And so you, by taking a, if you'll sort of allow the, me to use the, the paradigm that, that Kevin introduces, uh, by creating a new way of thinking, and of course, I, I imagine on the back end, maybe you can tell me a little bit about it. I'm sure there's some new technologies you, you've, you've had to figure out to, to turn a cigarette butt into a useful uh, part of a supply chain on the front end as opposed to the back end, et cetera. But by, by, by thinking creatively, by innovating, and then by going to a garbage company in Brazil or wherever and saying, hey, why throw all this shit in the landfill? We can help you make this work. We've got a partnership with, you know, RJR, whoever the fuck it is. And, and you tie you. So I guess th- this leads to a question, Tom, which is in order for your vision for TerraCycle to be true, you had to redesign, if you'll allow me the jargon, the ecosystem of the waste or garbage industry, did you not? Totally, totally. And this is what's so fascinating about when we get bought by these uh, garbage companies is that we work in a completely like such a different, different paradigm. We're technically both garbage companies, but one of us is doing it from this direction, the other from this direction, and there you couldn't compare them. I mean, you know, I'll give you some, uh, just a silly example. I mean, I'm in my, you know, in, in the office right now, you can sort of see the background, right? What it looks like. There's no garbage company that looks like a space, uh, you know, like this. 
I'm and not exactly fashion. sure what's going on back there, but it looks very funky, very cool. Well, yeah, there's like, you know, graffiti. It's, this is my office wall. You yeah. know, I mean, it's pretty, pretty nuts. Well, and also, I, would, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I got to believe the average quote unquote garbage CEO doesn't look like you. No, I would definitely. You know, you look like, you look like a, uh, and I, I mean this in a, you know, I mean this positively. You look like a cross between a hipster and do you remember the Muppets? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the drummer in the Muppets? Yeah, totally. I take that as a great compliment. No, by you, you look like a hipster met animal. The drummer, you know, you got the crazy hair and the beard yeah, totally. and, and you look like a, you look like a, a playful wild man. Let me say it that way. <laughs> That's right. No, and I, I try to be, you know, the, uh, and hey, here's a good example. You know, most garbage companies, 80% male, you know, and the very classic sort of, you know, garbage company approach. We're 75% female by staff. You know, everything is sort of inverted in the thinking process. And it's also why the partnerships are really good because they need that breath of fresh air. They want it. They just never been exposed to it. Again, like I really believe in people are all good, positive, looking to do the right thing. They just may not have opened their eyes yet to it. So maybe unpack that one a little bit for me. 75% of your, of your employees at TerraCycle are female? That's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have, in fact, in some offices, we have to work hard on hiring men. Like my London office is 90% uh, female. We actually are trying to coach our team to hire more men. Isn't that crazy? Uh, you know, it, I've had this experience once. You know, my, my, most of my background is in tech marketing as a CMO, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I can remember my last CMO gig at this company called Mercury, um, my second in command at the time came to me and said, we got a problem. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, all the candidates we're seeing are female and our last, I forget how many hires, but some, some meaningful percentage of our hires were female. And, and she said to me, I hadn't even noticed, frankly. Um, uh, she said, well, we need to figure out a way to get some more dudes in here. Cause like it's, it's, it's getting a little out of whack. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. And the same, so why is it women want to work at TerraCycle? You know, it's because what we have found, and it's not just in our employees, you know, we have a uh, hundred million people around the world who collect in our platforms, like you'll hopefully send us your cigarette butts. I'm, and in, 90, I'm in. Yeah, Right on. 91% of our leaders, the people who run the programs are women. What we have learned is this foundational truth about, frankly, being a good person uh, or doing or you know, sustainability is kids are awesome. Boys and girls, both sexes are incredibly good because they've grown up in this environmental century. They, grew, they were born into climate change and all these problems. And then after the age of 18, women stay awesome and men just fall off. Now we could guess many reasons why we can say maybe women, you know, have more of a motherly instinct, care about other things than themselves. Men are more selfish. They're more focused on themselves. You know, we could, I don't know the reason. Are, but you, those being, are, the, are you being, to quote Ali G, racialist against men here, Tom? <laughs> um, let's just say men. As a man, right, I get to, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when, uh, when uh, you know, certain people, you know, like certain groups can make fun of themselves, right? Uh, so I say this as a guy, um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and we need to care more, uh, and we need to open up our eyes more, but luckily at least the other half does. Um, and you know, that's what, that's who's attracted to our type of uh, business. But it's funny, you know, I want, I don't actually want majority female. I want 50, 50. I want, you know, as much diversity because the more different thoughts you get in the room, the more innovative you become, not just in, uh, sex, but in race, in age, in background. I want people who, you know, are all colors, who are rich, who are poor, not just one demo. Because if you go too narrow, you don't learn anything. You get stuck, you know, in, uh, with blinders on, right? And so the more diverse, the better. So I'd actually say, you know, while I'm glad we're majority female versus majority male, if I had those choices, I'd like to actually be much more balanced. That's, a, that's something we're act actively working on. You know, it, it's interesting you say that. We had uh, a, a while back now um, a gal uh, who's, who's well-known in Silicon Valley. Her name's Coco Brown, and she's the founder of this outfit called the Athena Alliance. And their, their primary objective is to help high-powered women um, get on uh, boards of directors. And yeah. so we were having this diversity conversation, and we had it sort of you know, back, back in the late part of 2017, when it felt like three times a day, you'd look, oh, fire up your browser and there'd be like some other guy who was being outed for horrible behavior and sort of the Me Too movement was starting and so forth. Anyway, I asked her, I said, okay, so what should a board look like? And she essentially, Tom said, virtually the same thing you did, which is, you know, if you really want to get this right, your board should it be a mix of, of a lot of diverse, uh, uh, on, on a whole bunch of dimensions for exactly that. And, um, in my experience, 
it does change things, doesn't it? Because you, you do, when you have younger people and older people and people from different parts of the world and different perspectives and different backgrounds and all that, you, there's a debate that happens that doesn't when you have less diversity. That's, that's been my experience. I think you're right. And I think this is another key reason, like, for example, everyone, the best thing someone can do to open up their eyes is travel, you know, just see the world, see how people live in other places. You know, it's not about seeing the freaking monuments or the buildings or the paintings. It's about seeing how does someone live in another place and not like another state. I mean, like, you know, get on a plane and land in a completely different language, you know, where they don't you know, speak it's, English. It's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I remember when the tragedy was happening in Charlottesville and, you know, when some of the ugly racism has, 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 has gone from being maybe somewhat a little suppressed and then it came out in, in America and in a, at least to me in a really frightening way, because I was sort of hoping that maybe we were mostly had, some of that behind us, let me say it that way. And I can remember being incredibly upset, particularly at Charlottesville at, and, and looking at my wife and saying, I bet you not one of these fucking assholes has a passport. Oh, I'm sure not. You know, what's crazy. What is it like something like 60% of sitting senators don't have passports? Well, and, and here's the thing I don't get about racism. And I know this makes me sound naive, but um, I look at it this way. Did you and I have any choice as to who we were born to, no. where we were born, and, no. and whether, I don't know how tall you are, how short you are. We didn't have a choice in any of that shit. I have a follic situation and you have the opposite. <laughs> or maybe you have a different follic situation, right? But we didn't choose any of this shit. So it's like, oh, no. you know, these people who are like, oh, I hate, you know, fill in the blank stereotype. I hate these people or those people or what? It's like. Really? You think yeah. that we should have privilege because you're this and not that? You fucking asshole. You haven't even been anywhere. You don't even know what you're talking about. Here's what I would say. You know, I, like, I was born in, in Budapest when it was communist. So I was born into communism. Um, and then you know, when Chernobyl happened, big nuclear meltdown, we left, went to Germany as refugees, political refugees, then uh, Holland. Landed in Canada because America wouldn't take us at the time because America doesn't take refugees well and landed there as local refugees escaping communism. I mean, that, that was my, you know, first. How old were you when you got to Canada? Can <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, eight years. And then I uh, came you, down. You were eight years old when you got to Canada? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And were you in, remind me, were you in Vancouver? No, Toronto. Oh, you were in Toronto. For some reason, I thought you were on the West Coast. So I, I don't know if Heather told you, but um, I, I was born and raised in, in Montreal, Canada. And then I lived in Toronto for, for years oh, before right uh, I moved to the U.S. about 30 years ago. But it is an interesting thing, you know. Uh, and of course, we don't want to really go far into politics. But uh, when you see Justin Trudeau, Canadian Prime Minister, on the tarmac at Pearson Airport, welcoming Syrian refugees and, and the refugees are crying and it's like, come on. And, you know, in America, this is a country that was founded and built by fucking immigrants. Everybody's an immigrant, yeah. right? Like, what are we even talking about? Not even it, that far away, man. And like, we're talking not many generations either. It's not like, oh, it's been a thousand years, you know? The, here, and here's the crazy part. The part that I don't get about this whole thing is America because a lot of the people, you know, have like this racist point of view, I think, because they've been disenfranchised during their lives and they want to blame somebody, you know, and they want to point the finger. It's like, you, man, because of you, I don't have my job anymore, you know, and because of you, I haven't gotten a raise. And because of you, my life sucks. That's sort of, you know, what it boils down to, at least, you know, you know why I think. And yet you, the guy saying that lives in a country with the most fucking opportunity out of any country in the world, you know, this country is built on the American dream, which is work hard and it'll get there. It's just, you can't be lazy and have the American dream. Well, and, and here's the other one. If you get, if you start to dig into the data about entrepreneurship, yeah. of course, immigrants are disproportionately entrepreneurs. That's Where, right. Whether, whether that's, um, you know, uh, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a, um, uh, a country that's done, uh, has a lot of immigrants here in Silicon Valley and has been incredibly successful. We have a lot of successful Indian entrepreneurs who live in California and who've done insanely great things and some of them become billionaires and, and all that stuff. So you have that on one 
extreme. And then you have on the other extreme, of course, the, the immigrant who comes here and they don't, they can't get a job or whatever it is. And so they start a lawn mowing business and they make it work and they raise their family and they, and they, and they provide for their kids. And so their kids can be better off and all that. And so the data tells the story, which is today immigrants are disproportionately entrepreneurs, whether they're billionaire tech folks in Silicon Valley or whether they're small entrepreneurs with lawn mowing businesses or whether they're Tom that has the greatest fucking garbage business in the world, right? That's right. I and mean, you know, how, how many jobs have you created since you horrible immigrant oh, well, came I mean, here and fucked the country up? That's right. That's right. So, uh, you know, right now two, we employ 250 people here, full-time office people, and then another thousand indirectly, you know? Yeah, but and you should have stayed in Budapest, you asshole. I, should. I right? should. You know, I don't even have a passport right now, so watch <laughs> out. <right? laughs> Did you but, become a citizen? No, I know. I don't intend to. I have a green card, um, and that's just good enough for me. Um, here, here's the thing, you know, I... Uh, I like honestly traveling uh, uh, on my European and Canadian passport just a little more than uh, my wife. She has an American one and uh, I, I get through lines a little quicker uh, being a Canadian. Well, so here's what I would share with you. So I, you know, I, I became an American citizen several years ago now and I still, you know, obviously I'm a Canadian citizen because you know, they don't force you to give it up. Um, and I thought about this. And I'm a little situational with it because here's the other aha I have, and this I'll throw Canada under the bus for a second, which is if I'm in Kuala Lala Ding Dong or wherever I am and, and something weird happens and I need help, uh, who do I want? Well, there's the Canadian government who could send over a couple of Mounties with a canoe to try to get me out of trouble, or there's the U.S. State Department. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Well, you know, look, it's, it, it's a very fair point. And uh, I love America. Let me just be super clear. I think this country is fucking awesome. I, and I'm thrilled, you know, to, uh, to be here it's, and continue to want to. You know, my kids are American citizens. My wife is. I just, you know, then I, you know once I uh, got the green card, I was like, you know, that's, that's fine for me. And uh, I just, you know, I think the, here's the important thing, all joking aside, is people are lucky to be here. You know, and I know it's sometimes hard to know how lucky you are when you are in the middle of it, it's much easier, you know, uh, to look at it relatively. And this is why get on a plane, go, you know, to Latin America and not just to Mexico, go down to like Brazil, you know, and see what life there is like, uh, you know, walk through a flavella. There's, you know, go to Eastern Europe and see what life there is like, or go to, you know, Southeast Asia. You'll have a great time, but you'll also see how fucking lucky you are. And that is actually really important, not in a way to create shame. You know, it's not about saying, oh, you know, you should uh, be so, you know, be thankful for everything. But once you realize how lucky you are, then you realize what you can do with that. And that is really, really powerful. You know, then it's like, oh, wow, let me now, you know, do more with this uh, 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 and uh, build something, do something, create something, you know, that you can be proud of. It doesn't have to be a business, it could be art, it could be anything, it could be just something cool, but definitely the last thing one should do is complain and point fingers. Well, and to your point, um, you know, you left Canada, I left Canada. It's not like we left Canada oppressed. I mean, your family left Budapest oppressed, but right. Canada is not a country anybody's running from. But at least for me in the tech industry, uh, Tom, I was able to create a career and a life for myself um, in Silicon Valley that you know, not that there aren't successful tech entrepreneurs in Canada. There are many, and there are more over increasingly, which I'm super stoked about. But the career that I've had uh, would have been very hard to have, let's say it this way, in Canada. Same and for me. So same for me. You feel the same way? Oh, 100%. When I tried to raise money, you know, as a 21-year-old college dropout, you know, for TerraCycle, I went to my Canadian friends for more at first. I had, you know, some friends that I got to know who had some cash and none of them would invest. And then in America, people who I didn't know would invest. And that is so fucking special. This place is built on the idea of entrepreneurship and what it does is it takes risks and it lets you fail. Those two things, no other country lets you do like the United States lets you do. You know, in Germany, for example, it's one of the biggest economies in the world. You, you start a company, you bankrupt it, you are legally precluded from starting a new company for like a decade or something. Here in America, you could bankrupt your company in the morning and then incorporate in the afternoon. I mean, a little you know, exaggeration, but not much there. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's been my experience. Um, and, and, and look, of late, there's been a lot of people who have negative things to say about Silicon Valley, some of which are very valid. And we can talk about those points if you like. But to your point, the number of incredible executives, incredible uh, people with you know, amazing careers, and of course, entrepreneurs who have massive failures uh, in, their, in their history and then massive successes. And the other thing I love is, you know, a lot, like a lot of entrepreneurs here over time, they become venture capitalists. And, 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 and so, you know, legend and loser, sometimes, sometimes you're a legend, sometimes you're a loser in the same day, right? And so we can be failing here and succeeding there. And, and it's, it's, we're living in this entrepreneurial Petri dish, experimental Petri dish. And there's an acceptance that if you're generally a smart person, applying yourself you're a person of good values so it's not like you're ripping off investors you're not you know this asshole gal at theranos and that kind of stuff but you're 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 actually trying to do something awesome and you fail if you're a good person we're going to give you another shot that's the magic and that is uniquely american and i think that is what makes america so amazing is the ability to get up right and to not and i think that's it you know like Every success, I think, it's basically a mountain of failure with the outside, like, you know, uh, crust being the success, <laughs> right? And you, you need to be cool with that. And I think that is uniquely American and what makes this country incredibly special um, and something that there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. And we should be honored, you know, I'm honored to be here and luck, feel lucky to, uh, 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 to be here. But it's not a, that's not a, you know, one person wins, one person loses situation. It's... It's where everyone, you know, can win, but people have to participate and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and do so in a positive energy, right? Because negative energy gets people down, doesn't help, it creates anger, hatred, and man, you don't build anything that way. Um, you need to, you know, do it with a smile. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you, so you, how, remind me how old TerraCycle is now, Tom? We're 15 years. Yeah. So, so freaking cool. And so how do you think about, and you know, you tell me if this is too far out in the future, but how do you think about the next 15 years of the business? Well, we have a big, a huge new thing coming out that I think will be our future, which we're launching in January. It's called Loop. And uh, it's our third business model. Uh, we're actually launching it at the World Economic Forum, so a pretty big stage. And it's going to go live in uh, the New York area and uh, the Paris area. Uh, and then from there, London, Tokyo, and a few other cities, but Paris, New York to begin with. And the concept of it, remember we were saying earlier, it's like the root cause of garbage is disposability. So Loop, is an engine that is moving the world's biggest consumer product company, the very biggest of them all, and the world's biggest retailers from disposable supply chains where the best thing you could do with their objects is to throw, is to recycle it, and mostly, usually you can only throw it out, to durable supply chains where all that will ever happen is repair and reuse. And it's for all of your favorite products from, you know, the world's uh, most important ice cream to orange juice to shampoo and you name it. So imagine a system where, which will be live again in January, where every product, everything you have comes in amazing, luxurious, durable, uh, functional packaging, which you as the consumer never own. You simply borrow it. And then we take it back from you, dirty, nasty, like, just like garbage, clean it, set it back up. And then out it comes again. And the entire concept of waste uh, is eliminated. I mean, even the shipping container we ship at you, uh, it is not cardboard and bubble wrap, but it's super durable container that just goes around and around. And wow. so, to us, so we think sort that's of like a, transformational. Yeah. Is it kind of like reusable uh, grocery bags for everything, sort of conceptually? Yeah, it's a match. Maybe a good metaphor is uh, uh, the milkman meets, you know, uh, Amazon. Right. So that all of the, let me make sure I'm getting this right, that the vast majority of packaging that I consume, um, I then am able to put back into this ecosystem and away it goes. That's right. That's right. You never own it. You simply use that while you use it because here's the point. Why would you want to own a disposable package? That package is only great from the moment you open it. Well, really until you're done eating it, like for a cup of coffee, that cup of coffee is only good for like 10 fucking minutes. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, you know, we, um, 
um, my wife does two things. She builds beautiful homes and she's a, a corporate event planner. And so when, in both, in both jobs, uh, she ends up dealing with a lot of shit getting shipped to our house, whether it's, you know, a bunch of tile for the house we're building or a bunch of things that she's using at some ding dong event. And so we have a lot of shipping material and the, the UPS guy and the FedEx gal, and they're, they're around a lot. Anyway, long story longer, we have a UPS store here in Santa Cruz and they take all that shit back. They take the boxes, they take the bubble wrap, they take the chippies, they take all that and they reuse it. And so we show up like once a week with all this stuff and, you know, we're trying to do this kind of a program in our own little way with our neighborhood UPS store. The fact that you figured out how to do that at scale with, you know, tons of packaging, that's incredible to yeah. And that's, man, I'm glad you like it. So that's, uh, yeah, coming soon. Uh, it'll be called Loop and it'll uh, launch in January. So we're... Will you come back and tell me how it's going? Oh, for sure. I'd love to. I'd love to. I can't show you the packages now. I just wish I could, but, you know, my uh, clients would just cut my head off. But soon we'll be able to show you. And I'm telling you, the stuff you will see transforms everything. Like, you, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so you essentially answered, you know, uh, one of the other big questions rolling around in my head, which is, it's awesome to do all the stuff you're doing. And how do you affect consumer behavior and, and packaging and product development? Like if I had any idea that this blue plastic uh, water bottle was shitty, and if I'd bought a clear one, that would have been a better thing to do, or maybe I shouldn't have even bought this. I should have bought, like, the more we know about this and the more we can change our behavior and the more we can change the behavior of the companies, you're sort of, if you will, getting more upstream in the problem. Is that, is that how I should think about it? Yeah, because I think, look, here's the thing. The solution to garbage isn't recycling. That's sort of like recycling is like the pill. Let's say you have a migraine headache every morning and you take a pill, you know, like a Tylenol and the headache goes away. Okay but the headache's going to come back the next day and you got to do the pill again and it's going to come back the next day and so on and so forth. That's recycling. You still should take the pill because you're, you're in pain, you know, and it's important to, uh, to solve that. But it's not solving the root cause. And the root cause of garbage is disposability. And that's what we need to solve. Now, the important thing here is we can buy our way into it. We just choose those, you know, uh, ideas and support them with our money and vote for it. Because look, you know, we get hung up, crazy hung up, on a decision we make once every four years, uh, that's sort of a yes, you know, A or B decision, right? Our political vote. But we do that with a pen and a piece of paper or a punch card and a whatnot. But we vote every day. Or the Russians the- just tell us. <laughs> sure, sure. But they even only get right, to choose between it. A and B, right? Yeah, right, right? You know, right. and uh, typically half the group's happy, the other half isn't. And, but we vote for the future we want, for the world we want to live in with money multiple times a day, every day, and we do it blindly and don't discuss it and don't have shows about it and discourse and all of this stuff. And like, here's the way to think about it. You know, you don't have to be an expert at everything, right? Like you don't have to know that blue plastic is not going to be recycled, but clear is because it's so fucking hard to understand all the complexity of everything. I think it's unreasonable. Think about it this way. Here's a simple tip. The next time you shop, let's just say you're buying, you know, a beverage. Think about your decision this way. Whatever you buy, two more will show up on the shelf tomorrow and one less of every beverage you didn't buy will go away or one will go away of every beverage you didn't buy. Would you buy it differently next time if you think about it that way? Hmm. So if you buy a, just to simply, you buy a can of Coke. Yes. That means two more Coke cans will show up at that local convenience store if that's where I bought it. Yep. And, and, and you say one less Pepsi can will show up? Is that maybe? Not just one less Pepsi, one less of every other beverage. So one less Evian water, one less La Croix bubbly water, yeah, one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One less milk, one less orange juice, one less everything. So you're I mean, telling, awesome. you're really telling That's me that works. there's a massive butter, there is a massive butterfly effect when we oh, yeah. push it. I mean, you said you're in marketing, right? Like, isn't that the easiest way to do marketing is to find out what people want and give it to them, not to figure out how to get them to buy something they don't want. And when a, when a store buyer sees that sales of, in your example, Coke are going up, they're going to put more shelf space to Coke and take shelf space away from everyone else. That's like retail 101. That's how sure, it works. Sure. 
this crazy part is the people who vote for it, the consumer, don't realize how massively powerful they are. Here's a crazy stat. If, you, if we all stop buying chewing gum, the whole world, it would take six weeks and the idea of chewing gum would be gone. The, bank, the companies would be bankrupt and it would be over. Six weeks. of Stopping to buy one product would bankrupt the idea of that product. And do you use that just as an example or is chewing gum a really bad product? And no, 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 no. I think just, everything is positive example. and negative. Just an example. Because look, every, like I say, I don't believe in evil people, you know, like in general, right? They're the ones that exist are crazy exceptions, one in a billion, right? Or one in a million. Most people are good intention people. Most products are good products. Like cigarettes also have positives, right? Like we taught, yes, they give cancer. Don't get me wrong. They do kill you. Okay. But there's also a reason people smoke, you know, there is the, there's, you know, the feeling, the whatnot. It's, you know, everything, you know, uh, drinking alcohol makes people feel great, but also gives you, you know, uh, liver disease and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, you know, messes with you. Right. So everything feel good at night and not so good in the morning. <laughs> sure. Sure. Right. But everything has positive and negative. And who am I to make a decision on what's positive and what's negative at the consumer. Right. But we can, change the world way faster through business. I think business is the most powerful tool in the world, way more powerful than politics, than disease, than anything. And the crazy part is we focus on national politics like crazy and don't focus on global business, yet global business makes all the decisions and sets the pace. And the even crazier part in all of that is global business is looking for the consumer to set the direction. Yeah. And the consumer setting the direction with their blinders on. Well, and the cool thing, and this is why, or one of the many reasons I love entrepreneurship and why I love what you're doing is you are educating the consumer and the whole ecosystem, whether it's the product manufacturing companies themselves, or obviously the waste management companies, you have, you have created a new paradigm, a new category of thinking about waste and how to deal with it uh, 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 that has moved the world from the old paradigm to this new paradigm. And, and that's what innovative entrepreneurs do. Exactly right. Exactly. And, you know, look, I think this is for everyone. This is the great part. Entrepreneurship is exceptionally democratic. You know, it doesn't. Uh, and frankly, here's the joke as we talked about being, you know, white men, right? Um, I think it's actually if you're in, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, another demographic, um, America will love you even more for this sort of success. You know, if you're like an inner city kid, you know, from a tough city, like I'm in Trenton, you know, the third most dangerous city in America. And if you're one of the local kids here, man, the media will put you on a bigger pedestal for doing something like I've done than, you know, me doing it as a white guy. Yeah, the, uh, absolutely. They get a lot more credit than oh, another white guy started a business, right? Dude, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so this is the irony, right? I think people should take advantage of this stuff. We should shop with our eyes open. We should vote for the world we want and we should realize especially being in this country how lucky we are and how much room there is for everybody there's there, there frankly if, if i had a chance to vote for this immigration question i say you know bring in as many people as possible it'll grow the economy it'll grow everything and there's plenty of room you know it'll never become like japan where you have 100 million people in the size of a place like new jersey well, and this is, you know, uh, not the, to get into immigration policy, but I, I don't understand why, you know, America doesn't say, okay, great. If you graduate from a good school somewhere else in the world and you're in the top, I don't know, I'll make this up, 1% of that school in, you know, think about the fields that we need smart people in. We, can, we give you a fucking green card. America could yeah. steal the intellectual capital of the future in like less than five years if yeah. it wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what should happen. We should be stealing all the smart people instead of uh, making them feel not welcome. Because, man, those people pay a lot or, of taxes. Or protecting the dumb people, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Some people have their virtues too, though. <laughs> well, you know, listen, we all have to have that dumb friend because it makes us feel better. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so um, anything else on your mind? Anything else you want to touch on, Tom? 
No, my man, it was a great conversation. I really loved it. I'd, uh, we'll definitely come back and talk to you about that breakthrough platform when I can actually be less cryptic about it and show yeah. you all about it. No, I appreciate you, uh, you know, uh, if you will, showing a little leg on that, giving us a little glimpse into to the future. And um, when you're able to kind of unveil all of it and who, who your partners are and, and, and so forth and so on, I think it'd be a very exciting follow-up discussion uh, uh, next year. Absolutely. Well, I, thank you so much. Real pleasure. Well, thank you, Tom. You're awesome. Um, uh, on behalf of Heather as well, you know, I know she's been a huge fan of the company and covered you for a long time. And uh, we just love that you're in our new book, uh, Niche Down. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing, Tom. It's awesome. <laughs> Man, thank you. You as well. You as well. Have a good one. All right, brother. Be legendary. Ciao. You as well. Ciao. Whew. Tom Zaki, everyone. Incredible. If you love this episode of Legends and Losers as much as I do, uh, why not email it to somebody who you know would enjoy it? And uh, we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared this episode on social media right now. Your shares mean the world to us. Um, there is, you think about yourself. If somebody recommends something to you, a friend of yours says, hey, you got to try this restaurant. That's the most powerful thing that uh, a business can get. And uh, as you know, Legends and Losers is a labor of love. And if you love Legends and Losers, we'd ask you for some labor. <laughs> that is to say, share the show, um, tell people about it, as, as I know many of you do. I really appreciate it. And if you have a chance, spend two seconds and give us an iTunes review. All right. Now, is it grow time for your business? Because our friends at Oracle NetSuite want to help turbocharge your growth. Um, check out legendsandlosers.com. Uh, yeah, check that out too. Excellent website. <laughs> but before you do that, check out netsuite.com slash legends. And uh, NetSuite is offering a free growth review to entrepreneurs who listen to Legends and Losers. Is your cash flowing in the right direction? Uh, have you looked at your monthly burn rate lately? What's the delta between the burn rate and the cash flow? That's always an interesting question. Uh, what products are your best sellers? What products are your, uh, have your best margins? Are those two the same thing? And are you selling in an omni-channel way? According to public relations firm Walker Sands Communications, 57% 50 of consumers shop online at least once a month now. And 25% of consumers own a voice device, and 20% of that group use the device at least three times a day. And so if you want to grow your business, one of the best ways to do it is to be what's called an omni-channel business and do omni-channel commerce. That is to say, do business where your customers want to do business. And of course, today, that's often digital, that's often mobile. And NetSuite allows you to build super responsive, device-optimized digital shopping experiences that display beautifully across smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. With NetSuite, you have only one platform instead of multiple fragmented systems to deliver that kind of uh, complete user experience across all of those uh, quote-unquote omni-channels. NetSuite is the number one cloud company in ERP for accounting and back office operations and the complete platform for growth that you need. So please check out netsuite.com slash legends. And there you'll be able to set up a growth review with an expert in your industry to talk about omni-channel, to talk about finances, cash flow, and even HR. Check out netsuite.com slash legends. All right. We would like to thank the good people at TerraCycle. Recycling is everything. Check out TerraCycle.com. Skinny pasta. Tastes great. Feel great. Look great. Check out GKSkinnyPasta.com. Com. Harper Collins Instant Classic Play Bigger, how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. Why not pick up a couple hundred copies wherever you buy great books today? Our good friends at Equity Directory, if you are in the startup ecosystem, if you're a startup looking for talent, if you're somebody who wants to go work for a startup, or maybe you're a consultant or an advisor or a freelancer, and you want to partner with startups, and most importantly, you want a piece of the action, that is to say you're willing to work primarily for equity, check out equitydirectory.com. Our good friends at One Life Fully Live, they want you to have a legendary life, to dream, plan, and live your best life. We're a nonprofit trying to make a difference for you and for many others. We have events all around the United States. We have a lot of awesome content online. Check out onelifefullylived.org. The Front Row Factor. 
a great new book by uh, my friend and guest on Legends and Losers, John Vroman. Check out The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. And if you book public speakers, you got to know about Brother James. He's been a guest on Legends and Losers. He's got motivational music for your next corporate event at Brother, B-R-O-T-H-A, James. Dot com. And don't forget the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, because our planet has only one planet. <laughs> Best we can tell unless Elon gets us somewhere else. So let's save our planet and our wildlife. Check out WWF.org. All right. I must remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. And we would love you just a little bit extra if you wrote us an iTunes review right now. <laughs> All rights do remain disturbed. Um, this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Hey, man, that suit is you. In the event of business bullshit, please take two legends and losers and tweet us in the morning. Never jog near a prison. Support our local entrepreneurs. Watch out for Putin. Scotch, not just for lunch anymore. Visit Canada. It's nice and clean up in the great white north. Uh, it's okay to pee in your wetsuit. Go ahead. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mum and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, CEO and owner of Rose Acre Farms. Sorry, Marcus, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. It means the world to everybody at Legends and Losers. Of course, it means the world to me. As you know, this is a labor of love, and um, we hope you're loving the labor. Uh, and we'll see you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers.